tectonic theory, which, as I'm sure you all know, was uh, led to a revolution in the earth sciences, in my way of thinking, equivalent to Darwin and biology. Um, and uh, it, it turned out by amazing lucky coincidence that nobody had ever looked at the bedrock geology of Humboldt and Del Norte County coast ranges. Uh, just some cursory mapping for the state regional sheet, but that was about it. And I've, I'm a sedimentologist by training and also a structural geologist. And, um, and uh, so I just started working uh, south of Patrick's Point and mainly looking at the sedimentary rocks in the Franciscan complex. And from there, I got interest in the igneous rocks and the metamorphic rocks, and so I sort of finished up 25 years later. Uh, so it was uh, very rewarding because it's a beautiful place to work. Uh, the best outcrops are along the ocean, and as you might know, in the field season, there's no more beautiful place to work than on the coastal exposures in Humboldt County. So it was a long, long road, not as long as the Grateful Dead as a band, but anyway, it, it lasted <laughs> quite a while, and I got a, a lot out of it. Uh, years ago, when I first came here, I had a student, Steve Miller, who did a thesis uh, where the Petrolia Road swings inland, and we found uh, that we had a couple of units. First of all, we had little pieces of wildcat group. And we couldn't go and investigate them because it was on the Zanoni Ranch. And I've been run off at gunpoint many a time on the Zanoni Ranch. Uh, but Steve Miller and I, in one of the best senior thesis advising moments of <laughs> my life, went under the barbed wire fence, crawled up a drainage at night with a full moon, and we collected a bunch of samples <laughs> from this patch. Now, uh, in addition, uh, we found the McNutt Fault, as we named it, and then we found these rocks here, which are now called coastal belt Franciscan. No, hold it. Coastal terrain Franciscan. <laughs> this is a problem. And then we found what we named the Zanoni Fault after our friendly landowners. And uh, then we found a group of rocks which Tom Dibley, the pioneer of mapping in California practically, had said, well, they're not Franciscan and they're not wildcats, so he painted them a different color. Uh, so uh, they're down in here, there's the mouth of the Matoll, and McLaughlin said, no, they're part of the uh, coastal uh, belt, and I said, no way. And You know, finally, after 20 years of arguing with him, in his latest papers, he said that maybe they're not the coastal trend. So, <laughs> fine. Now, in 1993, uh, thanks to uh, Thomas Dunklin, uh, a former student here who lived in Petrolia, we got permission after years of effort to go down to False Cape. False Cape is here. And voila, found a new terrain. Last thing we need. In fact, Cowan <laughs> said the last thing we need is another terrain. But sorry, here it is. And what's interesting about the False Cape terrain is it's mainly a giant recumbent fold and uh, there's a lot of fossils and we got an age on it of uh, early Miocene. And the state of deformation is such that McLaughlin felt it should be considered to be part of the Franciscan. So now we've pushed the age of the Franciscan all the way to the early Miocene, which is the youngest Franciscan anywhere. And it was amazing when we went down there. The first time we went down, we walked by these cliffs, and I thought, my God, what have we found? You follow the beds, they turn right over. This gigantic fold, and the beach runs right along the axis of the fold. 
<laughs> I, and there are oil seeps, there's oil pouring out. I got Bob McLaughlin interested and he came up and we went out. He said he'd get all the survey micropaleontologists to identify the ages and voila, early Miocene Franciscan terrain, uh, which has been subjected to profound deformation and the wildcat group sits on top of it. Now at Crescent City there is a very important outcrop showing the mode of development of a melange unit and uh, it, this melange unit is uh, fronts the Crescent City coast and it's in the, the shaded area and it contains uh, to the east upside down turbidity current deposits, sandstones and shales chiefly, they're overturned and out towards the ocean I visited all these islands offshore we have the same upside down turbidites with approximately the same orientation. I couldn't get off the boat and slap a compass on to, to measure the orientation of the bedding because the boat was going up and down by about eight feet uh, continuously. And, uh, this is Preston Island which once was an island but the army quarried it. It used to be about 200 feet high. It's a block of acidic oceanic volcanic rock, quartz caratophere, which is the volcanic equivalent of the plagiogranite. And it's uh, the largest block within this unit. It's about 200 meters across. And there is, thanks to the Corps of Engineers, very nice quarried exposures of the matrix in which it sits, which are black in color. And uh, I mapped this out in great detail over a week, uh, thanks to Don Garlic providing a balloon uh, aerial photograph of the outcrop. And I, I brought a lot of people from all over the world there in a, in a GSA Penrose meeting in 1984. And I said, well, what should I do with these rocks? And they said, measure everything. And so I spent a couple of weeks measuring everything. And so these are all foliations and whatnot. I found a ghost stratigraphy within the unit. I was able to demonstrate that the style of deformation that was recorded within the unit was compatible with the Darrell Cowan model uh, derived from San Simeon uh, representing flattening. So that all these sediments plus the melange unit, the allistostrome, were deposited and then they were flattened vertically. And this I could see by the form of the class and by measuring, before I extracted them from the matrix, the striation or orientation of faults that develop by slip on the, first, the surface of the class. Um, so that was a lot of fun. I used to, every fall, go on a two-night camping trip with, uh, with uh, uh, Strat said, and we'd visit this outcrop. It's accessible except at extreme high tides. Um, now here is the main unit, and here are the upside-down turbidites, and here's the unit, and then bedding continues over there, upside down. And the most ex important exposure I've ever found of anything in my life is, is underneath the overhang here. Underneath the compass, we have an overturned turbidite bed, and then we have, uh, um, the, right at the compass, the beginning of this big debris flow deposit. And so this was a catastrophic submarine uh, landslide, debris flow and carried blocks as large as 100 meters. And this is very important because a lot of people think, how do melanges form? And, and it's very, very hard to demonstrate a sure mode of origin which explains the mixing of materials in a melange. And Crescent City, Point St. George, is one place that we nailed it. it was without a doubt developed in this fashion. There was a Geological Society of America conference of specialists here in 1984 
and a room about 80 total skeptics about anything everybody else says. And I brought them to this outcrop. And uh, they couldn't refute what I was saying. So one of them did write, I won't mention his name, he did write to me a couple of weeks after the conference and said, I know what you showed me and it, it looks correct. However, it can't be correct because it doesn't fit according to my model of how melanges originate. That, that is the worst type of science you can imagine. Model-driven science. Unfortunately, you see it again and again and again, especially in these days of computer modeling. You get someone, oh, I got this great model that can explain exactly how all of these rocks were deposited. And, and they get it all together and write their dissertation, but unfortunately, the outcrops don't support it. Mm -hmm. I'll be surprised if Don doesn't have a question. <laughs> well, what do the astronomers say about completely changing the angular momentum of the Earth? We don't need no stinking astronomers. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, uh, intuitively, I thought, uh, I, I think that's impossible. Regarding stromatolites, but I'll talk about my hero, uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the photos I have in here are from uh, the original uh, survey. This is uh, the exploration of the 40th parallel. Absolutely amazing endeavor. You drive across Nevada and you think uh, you're going at 70 miles an hour and you think, well, here you are in a mule or a horse riding across this valley. Uh, has a lot of country to cover. So they produce this all in a very timely fashion. And as I say, within 10 years of the start, seven volumes, which are about that wide, if you have them on your shelf, which I luckily do, um, describe the geology, the topography, and there were botanists and ornithologists and uh, paleontologists on the survey three, and uh, they produced this, and uh, ab absolutely amazing. Thank you. In uh, 1980. thinking about giving this talk, I, I thought, in a way, it's an illustration to you young people in the audience those of you who are young, of how science works occasionally. Because I got into a problem uh, dealing with a realm of hydraulics in which I had very, very little training. And I got into it uh, from field investigation. And it was a matter of coincidence of um, of uh, just uh, reading the the year-to-year -year geological literature and going out in the field, I'm a field person basically, and looking and seeing things and then going back to the library and sort of having two and two come together in a very strange way. And I ended up uh, myself and my son and uh, two of uh, our graduate students publishing a paper dealing with the effects of supercritical flow, very high velocity flow, maybe 10 meters a second of water over bedrock and what it can do, which is certainly something which I had never worked in before. <coughs> and I decided I had been doing a lot of work up at Point St. George, Crescent City, and there were a lot of fractures in the uh, uh, late Miocene St. George formation. And, uh, you know, part of structure is you go out with your compass and you measure strike and dip of fractures and you plot them up on a stereonate and try to figure out the, uh, uh, the strain recorded and the stress field and so forth. And, and uh, Pebble Beach, if the tide is right, is a nice place to do this. There are a zillion fractures and public land. So I went out there. And while the students were out measuring fractures, I was wandering around. And I saw some very unusual drainage features. There are a lot of fractures, and you got in the 
drainage of the bedrock platform, you get erosion down into the fractures. But between the fractures, I saw these sinuous grooves, and they were not fracture controlled. And I thought, how on earth do these form? Um, in low tide drainage of sandy beaches, you don't develop meandering systems uh, on, on the sand, so it's not a superposition of a meandering drainage system on, onto homogeneous bedrock. And God, I just, oh, what in heaven's name? And I went back after the class and other weeks and I looked at them and I, what, what is going on? And then this paper appeared by these Aussies, uh, Bryant and Young. And it, uh, and this is uh, why I'm saying that. I mean, this is, I say, I'm dealing with things in which I really had very little training. But I saw some things. I couldn't understand them. So I loyally kept up with my journal reading, and I saw a journal article. And I looked at the article, and a thousand flashbulbs went off in my mind. I thought, my God, what they're describing is what I have at Pebble Beach. And you see, it's not my, it's not my brilliance or anything. I'm, I'm reading the literature, I'm observing. But the main thing is observing. And in reading, don't believe what you read. Observe. That's the number one thing. What you see is what it is. And someone makes a mathematical model. Well, hoorah! M models can be made to do anything you want them to do. But your observations, photographs, measurements, this this is real science. You can be dead a hundred years and someone could look at your notes and, and there the measurements are. Concludes with, need more detailed measurements. But you know, I'll stick with my story. Thank you.